Section 11.1, inferences from paired samples. So paired kind of means I'm going to have two samples rather than one. So example one, a pharmaceutical company has developed a new drug that they feel will help people who suffer from insomnia get more sleep per night. So they get a random sample of 18 patients who suffer from insomnia and they record the number of hours they sleep um, for two randomly selected nights. So that's where my second sample is coming from. For one of the nights, they're given a placebo. We'll see that in the data. And we record how long they slept. And then the second sample, so we have one sample for placebo, and a second sample they were given the drug, and we record the hours of sleep. And so we can see most of the people slept a little longer. So the first person slept 5.5 with the placebo, 7.2 with the drug. The second was 5.6 with the placebo, 7.1 with the drug. So they're sleeping a little longer. Um, there are a few exceptions, right? One person slept 4.6 and then only 3.4 with the drug. Um, so they're not all sleeping longer, but it definitely looks like most of them are sleeping longer. So what we're going to do um, is we're going to do a new hypothesis test because we have two samples. And then um, we can't use the one sample mean t-test because now we have two averages and not one average. So we're going to look at their average sleep, but we're going to look at their average sleep for two different samples. So it's a little bit different. So we're going to have mu one for the placebo. So that's our first mean. And then we'll have mu two for the drug. So there's two averages, so it's a different test. So there's not a number that we're comparing to, we're comparing two samples, right? Other times we would just have an average and we would compare it to a single value, but now we're comparing two different samples. Um, and then D is gonna stand for differences. You can see that um, under the note, um, this is that sum of D squared. So we'll just use this to check for typos. I'll show you that when we get to the calculator. So just kind of keep that there. We'll come back to it in a second. So does the data show at 1% significance? So my alpha is 0.01. That the drug will increase on average. So we're in mean land. We just happen to have two means rather than one mean. The number of hours of sleep per night for patients who take it. So how, how do we figure out increase? So this one we have to be a little bit more careful because we have two averages, so increase and decrease aren't always the direction you think of. Um, but HO will be the same as always, that's the equal case, but in this case, we have the first average equals the second average. So mu one equals mu two. This just means sleep on placebo and drug are the same. And then I called mu1 the placebo. So mu1 is usually our first sample. So we wanna show that the placebo is actually less sleep than the drug. So that's why we have to be careful with the words increase and decrease and not immediately jump into anything um, when we have the two samples. So increase means it'll be higher later. So it means the first sample will actually be less than the second sample. So I like to write these in words um, so that I don't get kind of influenced by using increase or decrease incorrectly. So for this example, my hypothesis in math terms will actually be mu1 is less than mu2, meaning you're getting more sleep on the drug. All right, so what we're gonna do for these is we're gonna calculate differences. So that's what I meant by D above, because um, differences can tell us if there's a change. So if the difference is close to zero, then the sleep is the same on the placebo and drug. If the difference is less than zero, so when I say difference, we're doing mu1 minus mu2. So if it's negative, it means the second number is bigger. So mu2 is larger when it's negative. And then when it's positive, it means the first number is larger. So mu1, mu2 is smaller and you're getting less sleep with the drug. So negative means we're getting more sleep with the drug. Positive means we're getting less sleep with the drug. We usually like to talk about the second one because that's usually our more interesting sample. In this case, right, we're more interested in the drug than the placebo. 
So we're going to calculate differences. To save some time, I already did some for you. Otherwise, this would just waste a lot of time on the video. But to do differences is I'm just taking each value. So I'm taking the first one, 5.5 minus 7.2. And we get a difference of 1.7, negative 1.7. And that negative is important. And then we do in the next row, 5.6 minus 7.1. negative 1.5 and then for the third one 3.8 minus 4.9 and then you'd keep going if I didn't do it for you so again remember negative means they're sleeping more on the drug so that's why most of these are negative and then positive means less sleep on drug All right, so what we're gonna do is we're gonna go ahead and enter the data into the calculator. Um, I'm gonna give you two options. Technically, you never need to enter the first one or the second one. We can enter just the differences. Um, but let's say you had to calculate all the differences, so I'm gonna show you how you could do that as well. So pause the video and enter the data into L1 and L2. And then come back once you have it on the calculator, because I already have it there. So pause the video, I got the data entered. I have L1 and L2. So L1 is my mu1 list and L2 is my mu2 list. So drug and placebo. So placebo is L1, drug is L2. And then you're back because you already entered anything, everything. So we're gonna go over to L3. We're not gonna enter in the spots. We're gonna go all the way to the top. And if you find this too confusing, just type the difference data. Um, but this would be a shortcut to find all these values if I didn't tell you these values. So you're gonna go all the way to the top. Notice L3 is highlighted, not a point, not any of these. So L3 at the top, and you're gonna hit enter and you're gonna do second L1 minus sec second L2. So what I'm typing is I'm typing L3 equals L1 minus L2. This is at the top and then hit enter. And then what's really cool is it does the whole list for you. Notice it entered all those values. If you don't want to do this, just enter all this data on your own. It's just a nice shortcut because it finds it for you. So what we're going to do is we're going to do one bar stat for the differences. So we don't really care about these two. We only care about the differences. So we're going to go to one bar stat like we've been doing. Uh, but we're going to tell it to look at L3 because that's where my difference data is. So depending on how you entered the data, you might be telling it to look at a different list. But we'll go over to one bar stats. Make sure you tell it that your data is in L3. Oops, I went to two bar stats, one bar stats. L3, double check where your data is, right? Just in case yours isn't in L3. And then we hit enter. And then rather than calling this X bar, um, like the calculator thinks it is, I'm gonna call it D bar for differences. So my average will be negative 1.17. And we're just gonna use D because that's gonna help us remember we're looking at differences. And then we'll use S just like normal for standard deviation. And we get a standard deviation of 1.1757. Remember, we like five digits. So, so far, it's the same thing we've been doing, right? We're finding the mean and standard deviation. Um, we're just finding it from a different list. So we're finding it from the differences rather than the data. So differences are useful when we have two sets. Um, so what we're gonna do is we're gonna find T-score. Remember, we like T-score when we're looking at averages. The formula changes a tiny bit. So our formula for T-score, um, we're gonna use D-bar instead of X-bar. Our compared average is zero, because remember, zero means no difference. All over S over root N. So the denominator looks the same. Remember our old formula for T in section um, 9.3 was x bar minus mu s over square root n, right? Now we've just changed x bar to d bar, and mu is now 0 for no difference. So you'll write this formula down in a little bit, put it on a formula sheet. Um, and I just make it even easier. It's just d bar over s over root n. And that's because minus 0 doesn't do anything. So the formula that I'll be using is d bar over s over root n. So let's plug in. So we get negative 
over 1.1757, and then our sample size, I believe, was 18. So n equals 18. And then if you do type everything at once, you need parentheses. Um, otherwise, you could do just the top, just the bottom, and then divide. Ooh, and we get a pretty far z-score, negative 4.2222. So I'm pretty sure I'm rejecting, right? Because this is way beyond two standard deviations. Um, our difference was quite a bit smaller than zero, but let's um, do TCDF to find that out. All right, so step four again is p-value. So we like to draw the curve. Um, negative is on the left side, so negative 4.222. And then we have to decide which tail we're using. So that comes from here. So since it's pointing to the left, it's left tailed. So we'll shade the left side for less than. Um, so we don't have to double because it's a single tail. Um, we have degrees of freedom is 18 minus one or 17. So our P value will be T C D F. Our lower is negative 10 to the 99. Our upper is negative 4.222. And then for T, we need degrees of freedom, which is 17. And we'll go ahead and type that. TCDF, so same menu we were using in chapter nine. Um, it's very similar to section nine three, we're just looking at differences instead. And so we get a T-score. So this is one of those tricky numbers. Two, I'll say 2.9, because 8, 6 would round up to 9. E to the negative 4. So the answer is not 2.9, right? Remember, this means move the decimal place. So we go 1, 2, 3, 4. So 1, 2, 3 zeros. And then 2, 9. So make sure you're paying attention to these E's. Sometimes we miss them. They're very important. So this is very little risk. This is way below our cutoff of 05, that was, or 01 for alpha. So it's little risk, so we're gonna go ahead and reject. It's very unlikely this would randomly happen if there was no difference. So we'll reject HO. We're rejecting that there's no difference. So there is enough evidence to show that there is a difference. So there is enough evidence at 1% to show that the drug will increase on average, because we're looking at averages, right? Every individual person is different, but on average, it's increasing the number of hours of sleep per night for patients who take it. Cool. So let's comment on the uh, requirements and just kind of do a quick summary in this video. So the requirements are the same thing since we're in mean land. It's that 15 or 30. So since N is 18, we don't quite make the 30 but we at least make the 15, right? 18 is bigger than 15. So that means um, X bar is normal or D bar is normal, since we're doing D this time, um, as long as the data is not severely skewed. So we could graph it if we wanted to, but for now we'll just say as long as it's not severely skewed. But we could check the graph later to find that out. There's one more requirement for paired data. Um, we need the data to be paired. Um, so what does paired data mean? It means they're the same person. So I can't have a placebo group and a drug group. Um, that's a different hypothesis test. For this one, it needs the placebo and the drug on the same person. And so that was met here. It said it was the same person two different nights. Um, otherwise, the hypothesis test gets a little more complicated. There's so many hypothesis tests that we're not covering, we just don't have the time to cover them all. But we're getting a good idea of what a hypothesis test is. Um, so here's the summary of a t-test. We call it a paired t-test. So that'll be when we have two samples um, and they're paired. Um, two unpaired samples is an issue for later. Um, so the requirements are that the samples must consist of naturally paired data. So that's our new requirement. 
And then the second requirement should look like something we've been doing all semester. Um, they need to be at least 30, um, or we know they're normal, or again, if we're between 15 and 30, as long as it's not severely skewed. This is not new. This is the same as means. And then everything should look the same, right? Steps one and two are HO and H1 and alpha, nothing new. Step three is essentially the same, just a slightly new formula for the T-score. Right, D stands for differences. So this only makes sense when we have two samples, otherwise we can't find differences. Um, find the p-value, right? No, nothing new there, t-c-d-f, since we have t-score. And then five and six are the conclusions, just like always. Cool, so we'll do another one in the next video.